extra we will travel back to the Konya city center where our hotel is located if we get back to Konya early by early I mean like before five there are other stuff that I would like to show you in the city center Konya is also a nice city okay and Konya actually has prizes from European Union because it's an extremely clean city it is very well organized public transportation functions perfectly actually uh -huh. You know our prime minister or current president, right, Tayyip Erdogan? Well, his family was born in Konya. So, <laughs> in public services, they are really good, okay? So you will see that it's a really organized and well laid out city when we go to the Konya. And Konya was the capital of a Turkish civilization called Seljuks. So they have a lot of stuff from 11th century, from 12th century. We will see them from the bus, but if we have time, I would like to get off the bus and go inside a little bit so I can show you around. They have some interesting stuff in Konya too. So tonight we're sleeping in Konya and tomorrow we will continue to Pamukkale. Let me show you in the map. This is Konya, okay? And this is Pamukkale. We're talking about the four hour bus drive. We will make a stop in the city of Opium, as I told you yesterday, in Afyon, where you will find some nice products. As soon as we get to the region of Pamukkale, first we will visit Kolosea, which is another unexcavated mount. Then afterwards we will see the Hierapolis. That's where we have this thermal pools. Have you ever seen any images of Hierapolis or Pamukkale? Yeah. They have this travertine pool, right? It looks like a waterfall yeah. from a distance. Well, we have a special stone there named travertine, okay? It is not a typical stuff on Turkey, actually, in many different places, of course. You can find a lot of travertine, particularly in Italy, okay? It has different types. One of the biggest reserves, travertine reserves of the world, is located here in Turkey. That is Pamukkale. And it's a combination of two words. Pamuk means cotton, okay? And kale means fortress. So cotton fortress, we call this place because the texture of the travertine from a distance looks like cotton okay mm. and it's quite big actually it looks like clouds something quite fun the greek people when they colonized asia minor they built up an ancient city on top of these travertine pools okay that city is called hierapolis so tomorrow we will also visit that one you ask me about the pools if you can see the pools and get in the pools in Pamukkale you can but the water is not that profound it will come to your knees okay on the other hand our hotel tomorrow is a spa hotel in Pamukkale and it has thermal pools two of them that will be available and open until midnight and we're not paying anything to use them okay so you can enjoy the pools in the hotel tomorrow if you did bring a swim suit that's nice if you didn't that's okay the hotel has a shop that sells swim suits okay you can also find them there so tomorrow we will enjoy pamukkale then afterwards we will continue to ephesus patmos and simirna Um, the St. Philip used to have a cathedral from the Byzantine period in Hierapolis. Only some ruins are visible from a distance. Okay, so when we go there, I will explain it to you. The thing with Pamukkale and Hierapolis is that the ancient sites are far away from each other. So when you try to walk, it takes a lot of time. Usually we rent a shuttle there, okay, a shuttle bus. I would like to arrange one for you too that will take us to the theater of the city to the martyrion of saint philip if you want to and you will get around a lot more easy okay that's the possibility so it depends what would you like to do in here a police but once we get there tomorrow we can talk about it ephesus on the other hand will be marvelous when we go there the very next day because ephesus is very well reconstructed by the german archaeologists and all the historical parts of the city are located in the same point so the visit there is a lot less complicated oh the okay. germans did that huh germans, germans did that oh. germans did everything in the archaeological okay. sites oh. <laughs> that you will get good. to visit uh, they did a pretty good job with ephesus actually once we arrive there you will see that the city almost looks intact very well protected so you can see the roman streets you can see the temples a lot of public buildings and it's just like an opportunity to delve into the social life of the romans i'm sure you will also enjoy ephesus it's like one of my favorite ancient sites actually i'm very glad that you have it also in the itinerary so yesterday we did not talk about much 
uh, Adana, you know. We only went to the city center, the historical part of Adana and the clock tower. Uh, the name of Adana is coming from Greek mythology. There are some different theories about the name of Adana. The Greek god of sky, Uranos, Uranus, we call him, right? He had two sons. One of the sons was named Adanos, okay? So there are mythological accounts suggesting that the city was founded by Adanos. That's why it is called Adana, okay? We have another Greek god, very well known, especially in US. We call him Adonis, right? A very well known symbol of male beauty, actually. Some Greek colonizers of the city used to build a lot of Adonis temples. Well, he's known because he is, was handsome, of course, but also he is related to fertility. And the soil in the Adana region is quite fertile, actually. That's why we think that the worship, the cult of Adonis was quite common. And the name of Adana is coming from Adonis. This is the second theory. And the last one is a Greek king from the Hellenistic period that came to the city in the 3rd century BC. His name was also Adanus. So we think that maybe that was it. The name itself came from Adanus. So there are different theories about the city. And in Cilicia region, Adana and Tarsus are both important capitals. And during 2000 years, if you look at the historical sources, you will see that the power shifted between the two. Sometimes Adana was mostly more important, sometimes Tarsus was more important. For example, when Cilicia region was colonized by the Hittite people, their capital was not Tarsus, they preferred Adana. For them, it was like a more strategical position. You would just cross the Taurus Mountains because the Hittite capital was located near Ankara, or current capital. So they would cross the Taurus regions and they would find Adana right next to it, very close to Syria. So they thought it was a strategical focal point and they can easily arrive to Syria from Adana. So they considered Adana like a military base, okay? Things changed during the Greek and Roman times. They thought that Tarsus was a great port which enables access to Israel, but also Cyprus. We're not seeing in the map, but as you already know, between Turkey and Israel, we have a huge island. Half of them are Turkish, half of them are Greek. We call it Cyprus, right? So for the Roman people, the Cyprus island was quite important. That's why they thought that Tarsus was important. You can see that it just shifts between the two during the history of the city. Uh, that was defined definitely when Justinian changed the course of Sindus River, as I explained to you yesterday in Tarsus. When Sindus River dried up, Tarsus lost this battle between Adana and Tarsus. It was indefinitely unimportant because it was located very far away from the sea. So apart from 7th century, I can say that Adana was the most important center and today it is still like that. Adana is much bigger than Tarsus, as you already understood. It also has a very big geopolitical value for us because we have one of the biggest military base, US military bases in Adana. Did you know that? No. Its name is Injirlik. The word means fig tree because that neighborhood is famous with fig production, actually. And in 1951, United States built up an Air Force base there in Adana, in Injirlik, okay? 1951. And it played a very important role during the Lebanese conflict in 1958, during the Iraqi war in 1990s. So this is like a very important center and the Air Force is also used by Saudi Arabia many times. So this is like one of the most big military bases of the United States that we have. Because Adana is strategically well positioned. From Adana you can have an access to Syria, to Iraq, to Iran, to Mediterranean Sea, to Egypt, to Israel and to Lebanon at the same time. Okay, if you look at the map you will see that it's right in the middle, over there. So that's why it was quite valuable, especially for the United States and this military base is still operating. It's not as big as it used to be but it's still there. And culturally for the public of the city, it is also important, you know. In 1951, they also started to open up American colleges in Adana, in the city. Those were the first colleges teaching English, actually, to the city public. So they are very important in the cultural sense, I must say. My first Spanish tutor was married with an American soldier working in Adana, for example. Uh, it was this very nice Mexican lady. In 2001, 2002, we were studying together, and um, 
well, thank to that military base, I would say we had someone speaking fluent Spanish like in that city. So the existence of this military base is actually also quite important. Its name is Injirlik, okay, 1951. So another thing that I would like to tell you today, we have to talk about Armenians because we have a notion in the history of the city that is called the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia. Armenians, as you already know, from Armenia, which is located close to the Caspian Sea and Ural Mountains, or Ararat Mountain, right over there, okay? It's a little far away. This is one of the first Christianized kingdoms. The Armenians, as a nation, accepted Christianity quite early on, okay? And Armenian Christianity is a big deal. They used to live here before the arrival of the Ottomans and they stayed here after the arrival of the Turkish people too, okay? The Ottoman Empire was quite multicultural. They used to have Armenians, Greeks, Arabs, Russians, many other communities. They were practicing their religion and liberty during the medieval times, but they were just supposed to pay a tax to the Ottoman authorities in order to build up new churches or in order to build up new city centers, okay? So we have to keep in mind that the Armenian component in Turkish culture is quite important because before our arrival to the Asia Minor in 15th century, they had been here for a very long time, okay? The Armenian people. And all those beautiful buildings that I showed you in Bosphorus, like the palaces and mosques, they are usually built up by the Armenian architects, okay? So Armenians knew how to do commercial activities, how to sell their products. We have a lot of things with Armenians in common culturally actually also economically that's why they are so important for us when Turkish people invaded Asia Minor we used to have very substantial Armenian community Armenian communities in Constantinople in Izmir in Antioch and also in Tarsus okay so the Armenians of Tarsus had been here for a long time we know that they founded this kingdom of Armenia in Tarsus in the 11th century approximately the first thing that they did in the city when they invited and gained, invaded and um, gained the control of the city for the first time was to build a church dedicated to St. Paul, okay? We still have the ruins of that church in Tarsus, actually. And they stayed in Tarsus in power in the throne for approximately 300 years, okay? So we used to have a lot of Armenians, actually, until the First World War. We know that approximately 50% of the population in Cilicia region used to have Armenian origins, okay? They used to be here for a very long time, but today they are not due to some political problems that we experienced in the First World War, okay? Today we have so less. In our first day, you asked me about the percentage of Christianity in Turkey. I told you that it's 2%. According to Wikipedia, like 98% of our entire population is Muslim and Christianity represents a small minority. But it was not like that. During the Ottoman period, the situation was quite different. Constantinople had a lot of Jews and Armenians like any other big centers in Turkey. So during the Ottoman period, it was not 2%. It was almost 25-30% of the entire empire. Okay, Things changed during the First World War. We had some tragedies, important events, and because of these events, Turkey lost the majority of its Christian population. So we can still observe the Christian influence in public, in our kitchen, in our food, in our language, actually in architecture, but unfortunately they are not physically here. We had two important events from the period of World War, First World War. The first one is called the Population Exchange. In 1915, the Turkish government and the Greek government took a common decision uh, 